This morning I was reading something very, very sad, but at the same time, in its own way, something beautiful. It was a news report about a man who uh, was killed in a fight. Um, Apparently he had a daughter with an abusive boyfriend who came in the house and started a fight, an argument, and uh, was accusing the daughter of things. And father stepped in to defend his own daughter. And one thing led to another where the boyfriend hit him and hit her. And then he ran out and uh, came back again and hit the father again and he fell and hit his head on a concrete path and died. And uh, it was really, really terribly sad, but at the same time, that's what a father does, right? He defends his own. He fights for his own kids. And uh, you know, we, uh, we usually look at this gospel story, the prodigal son, and we focus on how terrible that son was, and how much he had sinned, and how ungrateful he was. And all of that's true. Um, but we don't maybe focus enough on the Father and that unconditional love that he has for both sons. Um, and maybe we should. Maybe we should, you know. Everybody wants a father like the father in the, in the news report. You know, we celebrate Father's Day every year. And if you go in the stores in early June, you'll see everything marked world's best dad, be coffee mugs or pillows or t-shirts or hats or whatever it may be. It can't all be the world's best dad, but it's good to know that there's a competition going on. People are trying to be that. And... Uh, bragging about it when they think they have the best one. But the... um, It's God the Father who's the world's best dad. uh, Because He's the Father who's willing to forgive a Father with unconditional love. A Father who's willing to sacrifice for us. Maybe not all of us had a human dad like that. I'm sure every one of us had a really imperfect human dad despite his otherwise excellent qualities. But the real father who models true fatherhood is our Heavenly Father. You know, we have to remember too that Jesus also told this story when he was amidst a whole bunch of people who had come to him and were drawn to him the tax collectors and the sinners. And then the Pharisees start to criticize Jesus for hanging out with them, for eating with them, for being friends with them. And so that's why Jesus begins to tell this story because the Pharisees don't think the others deserve forgiveness. They don't think Jesus ought to associate with them. And that was very much the mindset at the time and it's very much the attitude we can have. And when we look at these two brothers, the younger brother stands out because he does something so terrible. He goes off and squanders the inheritance on dissolute living, sinful behavior. And then he's desperate and he starts to come back. And then when he does come back, the older brother is envious of the mercy of the father. And he's angry. And he says... All these years I've slaved for you and I never disobeyed your orders. Here you go, forgiving that son of yours. You know, I think in one way, even though the one one son committed the big sins and it was easy to criticize, in a certain way, both sons were the same in this respect. They were both the same because they both had this idea of being servants or slaves of the father. When the prodigal son comes back, 
He's rehearsing his little speech to the Father. Father, I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He thinks he can get back into the house of the Father because he's willing to pay for it. He's willing to work. He's willing to um, do what it takes to make up for it. The elder son reveals he's got the same mentality. All these years I've worked and slaved for you. You owe me. You owe me for my loyalty. They both have the mentality of how it ought to work with the Father is that they're servants, slaves. They don't get the idea that the Father loves them unconditionally. He loves them before they do anything for Him. He loves them independently of that. And I would say that's hard for us to get that mentality into our own mind and heart as well, right? We're always thinking that we have to earn our salvation, that it's question of our best behavior and that God's always waiting for us to mess up and then we'll be penalized. But that's not what this is saying at all. He's saying that the Father's rich in mercy. That the Father shares everything with His sons. So He can say to the elder son, My son, you are with me always and everything I have is yours. Let us rejoice. Because your brother was dead and has come back to life. See, the Father gives unconditionally. It's hard for us to get that mindset. The Pharisees didn't have it at all. They were like the elder brother. These people don't deserve your forgiveness. We're the loyal ones. We're the ones that keep the law. We're the ones that have been there in the temple all the time. And it's hard for us to adjust and get out of that mindset. That the Father showers down His love on us because we're His children. We're His beloved sons and daughters. And it's the Father that will sacrifice for us. But what a beautiful and encouraging thing it is to know that that's the way God is. And that's the kind of fatherhood every human father should aspire to. And then we should rejoice in that mercy that He has for us. That's the hopeful way that the Gospel lays out for us today. And then St. Paul, also in the second reading, he reminds us of something that's so important. You know, that Christ died for us. He died on the cross for us. And that we receive forgiveness and reconciliation. And we are the ministers of that reconciliation in the world. In other words, we have to be the ones who transmit that message that there's a way to reconcile with the Father. That doesn't depend on us paying back the debt. But it depends on the blood of Christ that's already been shed out of love to reconcile us. All of us. Saints and sinners. We all owe it to that same Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on further and he says to those early Christians, we are the ambassadors of Christ in the world. We're the ones entrusted with the message of redemption and salvation. We're the ones that have been trusted with this message of reconciliation is possible with God. Because just like the prodigal son, we'll be welcomed back with an embrace. He'll put a robe on us and a ring on our fingers, sandals on our feet, and invite us into the banquet. That's the good news of the Gospel. Why is it so hard for us to accept that good news? I think it's a deep human tendency that we want... We want God to owe us. We want to believe and convince ourselves of something that's a little bit crazy. That we can actually hold God to account. We can make Him owe us because of our good works. When God doesn't think that way. God just wants to love us. and He wants us at the banquet with Him. Forever. In the kingdom.